Hello everybody, it's Zach here from realestatelicensewizard.com. Today we have a special video planned. Today we are doing 68 real estate exam vocabulary scrambles. A couple things I wanna go through before we get started. One, what is a scramble? Well, a scramble is a word or phrase formed by rearranging the set of letters given. Essentially, they're hidden hints for you to help with your studying. Why am I doing this? Well, I recently did a poll and 67% of you said you do not enjoy studying. So I figured I'd try to make that experience more fun for you guys. It's super easy and educational, so hopefully you guys enjoy. Two, obviously scrambles do not show up on the exam, but these vocabulary terms and topics I'm going to cover today will, so this should be a fun and helpful study experience. Three, these are topics that will be featured on the national portion of the exam, so yes, this video is good in all 50 states. And lastly, four, if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing for more real estate exam related stuff. That way you can pass the exam, no problem. All right guys, without further ado, let's jump right into it. So the way this is going to work is we're going to see the explanation. I'm going to give you a couple of seconds and then I'm going to show you the scramble and then I'm going to give you a couple more seconds and then you can come up with your answer. It's that easy. So let's do it. So this is our first one. A legal principle under which a person who does not have legal title to a property acquires legal ownership based on the continuous occupation of the property. And here's your scramble. Alrighty, so hopefully you guys came up with the correct answer. What is this? Well, it's adverse possession, that's right. So that's pretty much how these are gonna work. Pretty straightforward, hopefully you guys like it and hopefully you enjoy. So what is adverse possession? Well, adverse possession is a legal principle under which a person who does not have legal title to a property acquires legal ownership based on continuous occupation. The most well-known examples of adverse possession is someone homeless finding an empty building and living in, in it for years, eventually trying to own uh, their, their ownership. However, that actually rarely happens. More common examples of adverse possession occur through little things like continuous use of a private road or driveway or agricultural development of an unused parcel of land. Yep, so that's it for that one. Let's go to the next. Alrighty, so indeed that contains no title covenant and thus offers the grantee no warranty as to the status of the property title. So think about that one. And then here's your scramble. Alrighty, and here's your answer. Quick claim deed. That's right, a quick claim deed releases a person's interest in a property without stating the nature of the person's interests or rights, with no warranties of the person's interests or rights in the property. Quick claim deeds are typically used to transfer property in non-sale situations. Non-sale situations such as property transfers between family members, uh, this could work, you know, perfectly. Quick claim deeds are used to add a spouse to a property title after marriage, remove a spouse, maybe after a divorce, and much more. All right, next one. The interest held by one party to purchase property before closing. All right, think that one over. And here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Equitable title, that's right. The interest held by one party to purchase property before closing is called equitable title. So what does that mean? Well, there are different levels or steps during a transaction. Closing obviously is the final step. However, in between closing and the execution of sales contracts, the buyer has something called equitable title, meaning they have the right to purchase the property before closing. They do not have the deed or full ownership because closing has yet to occur. So that's the important uh, important underlining, you know, dis distinguishing quality of this vocab term, as they would say. <laughs> All right, next one. Okay, a noun describing an item that is attached to something. In real estate, after something is installed onto a property, it can be called this. All right, think that one over. And here's your scramble. A 
And here's your answer. Appurtenance. That's right. Appurtenance. So appurtenance is a noun describing an item that is attached to something. In real estate, after something is installed onto a property, it is called an appurtenance, meaning it is passed on to a new owner if the property is sold. An impertinence can be something tangible, like a tree, barn, water tank, or something abstract, such as an easement. All right, let's do the next one. All righty. Is a space of land between two use districts, such as a park, playground, or highway. The point of this is to ease the transition from zone to zone. All righty, think that one over. And here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Buffer zone. That's right, buffer zone. So a buffer zone is a piece of land that separates one property from another, typically utilized between two distinct zoning uses, like an industrial or commercial district, or even a residential and agricultural district. An example would be like a park, playground, or highway. All right, next one refers to the act of mixing a client's funds with a broker's own funds. Can be both legal and illegal depending on the state and circumstance. All righty, think that one over. And here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Commingling. What is commingling? Well, in real estate, commingling refers to the act of mixing clients' funds with brokers' own funds. Commingling can be both legal and illegal, depending on the state and circumstance. Typically, from an agent's perspective, commingling should be avoided at all costs. In fact, in most states, a licensee or broker who is found guilty of commingling their clients' funds with their own or maybe business account could actually have their license suspended or revoked. Commingling can be legal in some circumstances, which we've covered on this channel before, but in most cases, as an agent or broker, it's best to avoid it. All right, next one. When a person purchases property, he or she is given the rights to the property. These rights can be split up and given to different parties. All righty, think that one over. And here's your scramble. And here's your answer. The bundle of rights. So when a person purchases property, he or she is given the rights to the property. These rights can be split up and given to different parties. Think of a bundle of rights like a bundle of sticks. Each stick is different and can be separated from each other. The bundle of rights was designed to simplify the complexities of property ownership. Alrighty, next one. The procedure in which an original contract is terminated and replaced with a new one makes it possible to transfer all contract benefits and liabilities from previous parties to a set of new ones. All right, try and think that one over. And here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Novation. Novation is the procedure in which an original contract is terminated and replaced with a new one. The legal process of novation makes it possible to transfer all contract benefits and liabilities from previous parties to a set of new ones. In plain terms, it's a simple way to replace an old contract with a new one while maintaining most or all of its original properties. Alrighty, next one. An ad or advertisement is in one in which the advertiser does not disclose their name or license status in the advertisement. Alrighty. So I think that one over. And here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Blind ad. I think there was a typo on that one. I apologize about that. So a blind ad or advertisement is one in which the advertiser does not disclose their name or license status in the advertisement. Real estate brokers and agents must identify themselves in all advertisements 
and include enough information to notify the public of their status as real estate professionals. Not disclosing license status is illegal in most states, so it's crucial agents understand the ins and outs of blind advertising. Alrighty, next one. The right to enter and exit a property. And here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Ingress and egress. So, as simple as that sounds, the right to enter and exit a property, there are some things we have to like talk about. First and foremost, these rights come together. After all, it's impossible to enter a property and not to be able to exit it. So when hearing these terms, remember that they go hand in hand. Now, verifying ingress and egress rights is an essential part of the due diligence process when purchasing property for both real estate agents and buyers. If one of your clients is planning to buy a landlocked property, don't assume anything. Check records, have the land survey. If necessary, take extra steps to ensure the property holds its e holds in easement for ingress and egress. Woo! The, that, that's always a tongue twister for me. Ingress, egress, ingress, egress. But uh, yeah, so you get the concept. Essentially, it's the right to enter and exit a property, and it's super important to know, especially when you know, you're know you dealing with landlocked property and obviously uh, come career time. So yeah, remember that. All right, next one. All right, the legal concept of a claim to title appearing to be legally valid, but in actuality, the claim is defective. And here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Color of title. I love talking about color of title. Color of title refers to a claim that may have the appearance, or I'm sorry, appearance of having valid title to that property. But in reality, the person either does not hold actual title or there is significant defect or significant defect in the deed slash written document supporting title, making it invalid. Now, it's also worth noting just because the claim is invalid, that doesn't mean it can't turn into a valid claim. To do that, the title holder would need to go through something called adverse possession, which remember we talked about in the beginning. I think that was our first one. So, yeah, color of title. Remember that. All right. Next one. Any gain in the value of a property over time from any cause. Here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Appreciation. So this one is pretty easy and self-explanatory. In real estate, appreciation refers to the property's value uh, or more specifically, how much its value increases over time. All right, next one. The discriminatory practice of encouraging homeowners to sell below market value because the socioeconomics of a neighborhood is declining, specifically by the influx of minorities into that area. And here's your scramble. That one kind of gives it away. <laughs> These are funny, aren't they? All right, here is your answer. It is blockbusting. Yes, blockbusting. So, the discriminatory practice of encouraging homeowners to sell below market value because the social economics of the neighborhood is quote unquote declining, specifically by the influx of minorities into the area, is called blockbusting. Now, blockbusting also relates to white flight or panic selling, a way for those in the real estate industry to capitalize on the discrimination of uh, minorities. Panic selling is manipulating the values of the property to their advantage at the cost of the buyer and seller. And obviously, this is illegal. It's an illegal action, and you get in serious trouble for doing that. But of course, it's one of those things that you need to be aware about. And you know, if you see another agent do it on the field or something like that, you know, take care of that. Report them, uh, or you know, at the very least, tell your broker about it, or whatever the case might be. Alrighty, next one. The legal concept of saying you own a right to some form of asset or interest.
and here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Title. The legal concept of saying you own a right to some form of asset or interest is title. If someone has title, that means they have the right to own something like a house or property. Title might sound like a document or a piece of paper, but in actuality, it's not. It's just a legal concept, not a piece of paper. And not to plug another video, because I know you guys are focusing on this one, but I have a fantastic video on this channel about that. If you are confused about title, uh, please look it up. Please check it out. I can, If I remember, or if you guys are struggling, leave a comment and I'll link it to you. But yeah, that's title. All right, next one. A legal document that authorizes someone to act on behalf of another person, typically in business or for some sort of business transaction. Here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Power of attorney. A legal document that authorizes someone to act on behalf of another person, typically in business or for some sort of business transaction, is power of attorney. A power of attorney can end for numerous reasons, such as if the principal dies, revokes it, or courts find maybe any reason to invalidate it. Once a power of attorney ends, that person uh, that was an attorney in fact is no longer. An attorney in fact is another one of those terms that you need to be familiar with. I don't think we'll see that one today, but I encourage you to look that up if you're not familiar with it. All right, next one. All right, the right of the government to take over privately owned real estate for public use. And here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Eminent domain. So the right of government or the right of the government to take over privately owned real estate for public use is eminent domain. Eminent domain is the government's constitutional right. It's constitutional. An eminent domain for the federal government is protected under the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution, while for state governments it is protected under the Fourteenth Amendment. Alrighty. Next one. The event in which the government takes private property but fails to pay compensation or just compensation. So this one kind of goes with the one that we just did. Here's your scramble. And here's your answer inverse condemnation so a property owner can sue to obtain required just compensation through the process of inverse condemnation so yeah if the, if this event occurs if this is the that event uh, in which government again they don't pay appropriately um, then again property owner can sue to you know get what they they think they earn or they deserve through the process of inverse condemnation all right, next one. The government's right to take ownership of unclaimed real estate or assets. All right, think that one over. Here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Escheat. A sheet. So what does that mean? Well, when a property owner dies and leaves no proper uh, documented inheritance plan, the property ownership reverts to the government. That is a sheet. A sheet ensures the property always has ownership. A sheet is part of the reason it's critical to have a will or when you're purchasing property, you establish an explicit right to survivorship. All right, next one. States that a lender can penalize a borrower if the borrower pays off the mortgage much sooner than usual. So think that one over. Here's 
Here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Prepayment penalty clause. So what is that way? Well, prepayment penalty clause, which is another tongue twister. <laughs> That states that a lender can penalize a borrower if the borrower pays off the mortgage much sooner than usual. Yes, you heard that right. If a mortgage has a prepayment penalty clause, paying off a loan faster than usual can create a fee for the borrower. The fee occurs if a borrower pays off their loan before a specific period, typically within the first five years. Now, luckily, the good news for us and everybody else is the pre prepayment penalty clauses are becoming a lot less common but it's still important to be aware of, obviously, for your real estate career and just, you know, for your own own dealing with, you know, when you get a mortgage or whatnot. All right, next one. A required contract provision that ensures that the title for the property is transferred to the buyer once the mortgage is fully paid off. Okay, think that one over. Here's your scramble. And here's your answer, defeasance clause, defeasance clause. So the defeasance clause is a required contract provision that ensures that the title for the property is transferred to the buyer once the mortgage is fully paid off. In other words, the defeasance clause is a provision in a mortgage that will allow the home buyer to redeem the full rights of a property upon the last payment of the mortgage lender or to the mortgage lender. Basically, it's the clause that specifies that the lender must surrender all rights to the property once the mortgage is paid. At this point, the buyer gets title to the property. Alrighty, next one. The statement in a contract that describes the rights and interests being given. It almost always begins with the words to have and to hold. That's a big hint. Here is your scramble. And here's your answer. Habendum clause. So the habendum clause is the statement in a contract that describes the rights and interests being given. It almost always begins with the words to have and to hold. Therefore, it is often called the to have and to hold clause. Put simply, the habendum clause tells the buyer or leasee exactly what they're getting. For example, on one form of a real estate contract, let's say, I don't know, like a timeshare lease, the clause will outline the percentage of ownership being transferred and any other timeshare related restrictions. All right, next one. A parcel of real property that has an easement over another piece of property. All right, here is your scramble. And I'm sorry, I keep wanting to say scrambled eggs. I know that's ridiculous. And I know, you know, a bunch of you guys are being like, that's such a bad joke, but I have a weird sense of humor. So here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Dominant estate. Alrighty. So what's the dominant estate? Well, the dominant estate is a parcel of real property that has an easement over another piece of property. The servient estate is a parcel of property that is subject to an easement. An excellent way to remember which is which is whenever you hear servient estate, think of that estate serving the other. It is a servient estate because it serves the other through the easement located on their property. You can also think about the dominant estate dominating the other since it holds an easement over the other party's property. Pretty self-explanatory there. Alrighty, next one. A fee paid to an agent for performing a transaction. So think that one over. And here is your scramble.
And here's your answer. Commission. So, pretty self-explanatory one. Commission, fee paid to an agent for performing a transaction. Pretty straightforward. Not much to say there. All right, next one. The rights or right to use the space above the earth. These rights can be sold or leased. Here is your scramble. And here's your answer. Air rights. Air rights are the right to use the space above the earth. These rights can be sold or leased. Air rights are pretty necessary uh, when it comes to real estate and construction. Before air travel was standard, air rights were basically unlimited, fun fact. From the ground all the way up to outer space at the time, or at that time, you owned all of it. Now, obviously, it's a lot different. The government permits reasonable interference for certain things. For example, aircraft or hypothetically spacecraft. Now, as solar becomes more significant, air rights are becoming more relevant as well. In some cities, if a skyscraper is blocking another property's solar panels, it can potentially lead to a potential legal issue. Overall, understanding air rights is incredibly important. So hopefully you guys do get it. All right, next one. A way for money and property to be transferred from one party to another through the use of a neutral third party agent. And here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Escrow. Escrow is a way for money and property to be transferred from one party to another through the use of a neutral third party agent, also known as an escrow agent. Escrow makes it a lot safer for both buyers and sellers to close the sale without worrying about getting snubbed or cheated. Alrighty, next one. The act of intentionally deceiving another party for financial or personal gain. And here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Fraud. That's right, fraud. You don't want to deal with fraud. I'll tell you what. Fraud is the act of intentionally deceiving another party for financial or personal gain. An example would be if you tell a client a property is 5,000 square feet, when you know for a fact it's actually 3,000 square feet. That is fraud. Fraud occurs more often than you may think. Typically, fraud contains an element of intent. For example, one agent may try to manipulate a buyer to make a sale, or one agent may try to manipulate a buyer to increase the asking price. It's all about intent. Either way, you need to be aware of fraud and obviously how to prevent it. Next one. All right. Most big lenders or banks require the buyer to have an appraisal done to the property before the loan is granted. This is to ensure the house is worth somewhat close to the price of the accepted offer. So what is this? Here is your scramble. And here's your answer. Appraisal contingency. So most ben big lenders or banks require an appraisal contingency. This is to ensure the house is worth somewhat close to the price of the accepted offer. Pretty straightforward. It's one of those contract clauses or contract contingencies that you need to be aware about. All right, next one. An adjective meaning it is attached to something. If something is this, it belongs to something else, either attached to or by law. And here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Appurtenant. 
A pertinent is an adjective, meaning it is attached to something. If something is a pertinent, it belongs to something else, either attached to or by law. Typically, anything that has been installed or become a part of a property is considered to be a pertinent. Now, a great example of something described as a pertinent is the relationship between a barn and a house or an easement to some land. Typically, these things are attached to the property by law and are described as a pertinent. So obviously we did both a pertinent and a pertinence. We did a pertinence earlier. So what's the difference? Well, these two terms are usually applicable to property rights or items passed along with sale properties. The difference is a pertinent is an adjective to describe an attached object, while a pertinence is an item once it becomes attached to the land. So one is the noun and the other one is the adjective to describe that or to describe it. Does that make sense? Hopefully. All right, next one. Under this, all landowners whose properties adjoin a river or stream have the right to make reasonable use of it as it flows through or over their properties. All right, think that one over. Here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Riparian rights. Under riparian rights, all landowners whose properties adjoin a river or stream have the right to make reasonable use of it as it flows through or over properties. The only limitation owners have is they cannot stop or prevent the flow of water. Riparian rights vary from state to state, but most grant unrestricted use. Unrestricted use means owners have the right to access it for swimming, boating, fishing, building docks, etc. All right, next one. Rights pertaining to landowners whose land borders large navigable lakes and oceans. So think that one over. All right, here's your scramble. Alrighty, and here's your answer. Littoral rights. Littoral rights pertain to landowners whose land borders large navigable lakes and oceans. Littoral rights are usually concerned with the use and enjoyment of the shore. The landowner has access to the water, but only owns up to the edge of the water. While the state owns the land under the water, and the United States has an overriding interest in preserving it for obviously public navigation. Now a good way to remember the difference is when you hear the word littoral, think of lake, L for lake. And when you hear riparian rights, think of river, R for river. Pretty easy, right? Alrighty, next one. Occurs when one real estate agent represents both the buyer and the seller in a transaction. Alrighty, think that one over. And here's your scramble. Alrighty, and here's your answer. Dual agency. Dual agency occurs when one real estate agent represents both the buyer and the seller in the transaction. A dual agent cannot disclose confidential information to either party and must be neutral towards both parties. In most states where dual agency is legal, written consent is almost always required. It's also worth noting, in some states, dual agency refers to two agents working for the same company, each representing a buyer and seller, sometimes referred to as a designated agency. All right, next one. A purchase contract written by a buyer without seeing the property. Here is your scramble. And here's your answer. Blind offer. A blind offer in real estate is a purchase contract written by a buyer without seeing the property. This is common in commercial properties, such as apartment complexes, and it's not uncommon in multifamily homes, such as duplexes and fourplexes. It's not typical in single family homes or apartments. 
Uh, but yeah, blind offers are a quick and easy way for buyers to bid on a house. It saves buyers and sellers massive amounts of time by skipping inspections or appraisals. In plain terms, it's a chance for purchasers who can't or don't want to visit a property in advance have their offer considered. All right, next one. The constitutional authority and inherent power of a state to adopt and enforce laws and regulations to promote and support the public health, safety, morals, and general welfare. Pete. Think Pete. And here is your scramble. And here's your answer. Government power. Government power is the constitutional authority and inherent power of the state to adopt and enforce laws and regulations to promote and support the public health, safety, morals, and general welfare. This is established in the 10th Amendment of the Constitution. An example would be government powers range from small to large. Obviously, the most common example of government power is zoning. Now, obviously, you noticed at the very end it said PEAT. Well, PEAT is the best word or acronym uh, to kind of remember these specific powers. So P stands for police power, E for eminent domain, T for taxation, and another E for SGT. All right, next one means an offer for the property has been accepted, but there is a condition or contingency that is written into the contract and it must be met before the sale can go through. Alrighty, here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Contingent property. So a contingent property means an offer for the property has been accepted, but there is a condition or contingency that is written into the contract and it must be met before the sale can go through. Now, in order for the contract to be legally binding, the contingency must be met. A common example of a contingent property is when buyers of a home include a clause in the contract that states it is not binding until a satisfactory home inspection from a home inspector is completed. Once the home inspection is completed, the contract is then legally binding and the sale can proceed. All right, next one. means that the offer has been accepted and both parties are moving forward with the sale. When a property is this, it is in the period after contingencies are resolved. Here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Pending property. So the term pending means that the offer has been accepted and both parties are moving forward with the sale. When a property is pending, it is the period after contingencies are resolved. Now, it's normally not the best idea to make an offer on a property at this point, as the odds of the sale completing are pretty high. Usually a property that is listed as pending for a while is under contract and is awaiting approval from the bank. Now there are some circumstances where a pending property deal will fall through, so it's not a bad idea to keep an eye uh, on one of those properties, but obviously you need to be aware of how that works. All right, next one. In a state held by one who rents or leases property. Here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Leasehold estate. A less than freehold estate, also known as a leasehold estate, is an estate held by one who rents or leases property. The key difference between a leasehold estate and a freehold estate is the limitation of time. A lease is a legal estate. A leasehold estate can be bought and sold on the open market. Now there are four main types of leasehold estates, each having specific characteristics as the lease, the lease period and relationship between the landlord and tenant. And obviously you do need to be aware of those as well. All right, next one. 
arises when the tenant holds over after the expiration of their term. Here's your scramble. And here's your answer. A state at sufferance. An estate at sufferance, or an estate in sufferance, arises when the tenant holds over the expiration of the term. An estate at sufferance differs from the previous three as it refers to a position or person in possession of the property with permission from the owner. And those previous three uh, were obviously those four main types of leasehold estates that I kind of hinted at earlier, but we're not really going to go into this video. I just figured we'd just do one of these. But obviously, yeah, there's four that you need to know. This is one of those. Uh, but yeah, anyways, a state of sufferance. Another way to put it is it's a tenant who lawfully comes into possession of a landlord's real estate, but who continues to occupy the premises uh, improperly after his or her lease rights have expired. All righty. Next one. All right. In a state in which you have an exclusive right to enjoy the possession of a property indefinitely. And here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Freehold estate. A freehold estate is an estate in which you have an exclusive right to enjoy the possession of a property indefinitely. Contrast to a leasehold estate, which we talked about two terms ago, where possession is limited by a time period. Freehold estate, it's indefinitely. All right, next one. An interest in real property, which is held for the duration of the life of a designated person. Here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Life estate. A life estate is an interest in real property which is held for the duration of the life of a designated person. It may be limited by the life of the person holding it or by the life of another person. This designated person is called a life tenant. This is a pretty easy concept. When you see or hear the word life estate, just think of life. The estate only lasts for the duration of the tenant's life. Interestingly, a life tenant may sell mortgage or lease the property for the duration of the estate. However, all contracts must be terminated upon the death of the life tenant. All right, next one. Refers to extravagant claims made by sellers in order to attract buyers. All righty. Here is your scramble. And here's your answer. Puffing. Puffing. The term puffing refers to extravagant claims made by sellers in order to attract buyers. In plain terms, puffing is an exaggeration of fact. Many people, including real estate agents, are guilty of puffing. So is it legal? Well, the answer is yes, actually, because it is more of an opinion rather than a fact. That is why it is usually not considered illegal. Puffing is legal as long as the statements are not fraudulent. All right, next one. A way to resolve disputes. Typically, this happens when two homeowners want to resolve an issue and do not want to directly involve the courts. Here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Arbitration. Arbitration is a way to resolve disputes. Typically, real estate arbitration happens when two homeowners want to resolve an issue and do not want to directly involve the courts. All right, next one. The final step in executing a real estate transaction. It is when official ownership and payment is transferred to the rightful parties. 
And here is your scramble. And here's your answer. Closing. Closing is the final step in executing a real estate transaction. It is when official ownership and payment is transferred to the rightful parties. Closing usually takes place after a purchase agreement is made and the title is now ready to be transferred. All right, next one. Nonprofit corporation complete with a board of directors and each resident is a shareholder. Think that one over. All right, here is your hint or scramble. <laughs> And here's your answer. Co-op. A co-op is a non-profit corporation complete with board of directors, and each resident is a shareholder. That's the big hint for this one. Perhaps the largest distinction between a condominium and a co-op is that most co-op associations require that a prospective purchaser be approved by a committee composed of current co-op owners. Fun fact. Alrighty, next one. A United States federal government program designed to fund the cleanup of sites contaminated with hazardous substances and pollutants. Think that one over. Here is your scramble. And here's your answer. The Superfund. The Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation, and Liability Act of 1980, also known as CERCLA, or the Superfund, is a the United States federal government program designed to fund the cleanup of sites contaminated with hazardous substances and pollutants. All right, next one. How are you guys holding up? Hopefully pretty good. We are, I'd say, more than 50%, so hang in there. Uh, this would be a good time to, you know, go take a break if you're feeling like it. Because uh, I'm probably going to pause here and you guys won't even know. I'm going to cut it. But, you know, don't be afraid to take a break. All right. Anyways, let's do this. So uh, when two or more persons or entities conspire to restrict the ability of someone from competing, this is unethical and highly illegal. Oh, boy. Okay. Think that one over. Here's your scramble. And here is your answer. Conspiracy to boycott. So conspiracy to boycott occurs when two or more persons or entities conspire to restrict the ability of someone from competing. This is unethical and highly illegal. And that's why you need to be aware of it. All right, next one refers to the loss of property value due to external factors, meaning things off the property affecting the property's value. Here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Economic obsolescence. Economic obsolescence refers to the loss of property value due to external factors, meaning things off the property affecting the property's values. Examples of causes of economic obsolescence can include flight patterns, busy highway, rise in local crime, and more. Economic obsolescence can be caused by larger factors like maybe a recession or depression. Or when a factory maybe nearby closes and hundreds of people lose their jobs and local property prices go down. Those all would be examples of economic obsolescence. Economic obsolescence is usually unfixable by the homeowner. That's worth noting. Uh, for example, if there's crime in the neighborhood, no one is expecting homeowners to dress up like a superhero and clean up the streets. That would be ridiculous. <laughs> all right, next one refers to the loss of property value due to an obsolete design feature.
All right. There's your hint slash scramble. All right. Here's your answer. Functional obsolescence. So, functional obsolescence refers to the loss of property value due to an obsolete design feature, such as an old house with one bathroom in a neighborhood filled with new homes featuring at least two bathrooms, or maybe a neighborhood filled with two car garages, but your garage only fits one. Because the old house does not have what buyers in the market want, it is said to be functionally obsolete, even if it's still in good condition and is perfectly livable. Some common examples of functional obsolescence are poor outdated design, too many or too few materials or features, lack of utility, or maybe overly costing operating expenses. Those are all good examples. All right, next one. Annual crops cultivated by a tenant that is treated as a tenant's personal property. Okay, think that one over. Here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Emblements. Emblements are annual crops cultivated by a tenant that is treated as the tenant's personal property. They're considered personal property, not real property, but personal property, meaning they move with the tenant. Key thing here to understand is a tenant farmer has the right to his or her crops even when his or her lease ends before the end of the growing season. All right, next one. When competing brokers agree to split territories and divide interests accordingly, this is a clear antitrust violation. Hmm. Think that one over. Here's your scramble. Sorry, I was a little late on that one. And here's your answer. Dividing territories. So, what's dividing territories? Well, that is when competing brokers agree to split territories and divide interests accordingly. A clear antitrust violation. This is just another one of those antitrust violations you need to be familiar with. All right, next one. Is intrusion on a person's territory or property? Here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Encroachment. Encroachment is intrusion on a person's territory or property. For those of you who are football fans, it's pretty much the same thing as the penalty. If a tree grows over someone's property or when a fence or another piece of your neighbor's property crosses the property lines, those are all examples of encroachment. Encroachment can lead to some large legal issues. And if there are potential encroachment owners uh, and agents or owner, potential encroachment issues, I should say, uh, owners and agents should seek a solution immediately. All right, next one. A right held by one person to use the land of another for a specific purpose, such as driving through someone else's property. Hmm. All right. Think that one over. Here's your scramble. I think I'm going to get that on a t-shirt when I'm done with this. Here's your scramble. <laughs> Bad joke number two or three, maybe. And here's your answer. Easement. An easement is a right held by one person to use the land of another for a specific purpose, such as driving through someone else's property. Legally speaking, an easement has to be in writing. If you own the property, usually it's located on the deed. If you have yet to own or purchase the property, you can obtain a copy of the deed or uh, yeah, the deed itself uh, and find the easements located on it through county records. All right, next one. One broker is appointed as the sole agent and has exclusive authorization to represent the property. 
the broker receives a commission no matter what. Think that one over. Here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Exclusive right to sell listing. Woo, that one's pretty, as a mouthful in terms of uh, the scrambles. <laughs> so yeah, obviously this is an exclusive right to sell listing. Uh, the pretty much easy way to figure that out is if it's one broker and they receive a commission no matter what. So the broker receives a commission no matter what, who sells the property while the listing agreement is in effect. That's how you know it's an exclusive right to sell listing. All right, next one. Buys mortgages on the secondary market, puts them together, and then sells them back as mortgage security bonds to investors on the open market. Think that one over. Here's your scramble. And here is the answer. Fannie Mae, the Federal National Mortgage Association, also known as Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae buys mortgages on the secondary market, puts them together, and then sells them back as mortgage security bonds to investors on the open market. All right, next one. An item that was once personal property, but is considered real property either by attachment or legal addition. Think that one over. Here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Fixture. A fixture is an item that was once personal property, but is considered real property either by attachment or legal addition. All right, next one. This method of appraisal is a federal system defined by identifying reference lines. The system is based on sets of two intersecting lines, principal meridians and baselines. Think that one over. Here's your scramble. And here's your answer. The government survey system. So the government survey system is the method of appraisal uh, for the federal system defined by identifying reference lines. The system is based on two intersecting lines, principal meridians and baselines. It is sometimes referred to as the rectangular survey system. All right, next one is a comprehensive plan to guide the long-term physical development of a particular area. Here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Master plan. Yes, the master plan. A master plan is a comprehensive plan to guide the long-term physical development of a particular area. A lot of times this is how they establish uh, certain areas for certain zones and things like that. Alrighty, next one. An appraisal method that uses physical features of the local geography along with directions and distances to define and describe boundaries of a parcel of land. Think that one over. All right, so here's your scramble. And here's your answer, meets and bounds. So that should say appraisal and survey method. Um, I think that was a, a mis, mistype there, so I apologize for that. But yeah, we're dealing with surveying and appraising because it's kind of under the same tree, but yeah, this is primarily a surveying method. Um, but obviously, when you're learning about this stuff, at least in like the real estate textbooks, they cover it under the appraisal section a lot of times too. So that's probably why of the misprint. But yeah, meets and, brown, meets and bounds is, an, an, is a surveying method 
imported to the original colonies that formed the United States. The system uses physical features of local geography along directions and distances to define and describe the boundaries of a parcel of land. All right, next one. The amount of tax payable per dollar of the assessed value of a property. Here is your scramble. And here's your answer. Mill rate. The mill rate is the amount of tax payable per dollar of the assessed value of property. Mill rate is also known as the mileage rate. All right, next one is when an agent agrees to sell an owner's property for a set minimum price. Anything over the minimum price belongs to the agent as commission. Here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Net listing. A net listing is when an agent agrees to sell an owner's property for a set minimum price. Anything over the minimum price belongs to the agent as commission. It's worth noting this is illegal in some states. Um, it's outlawed, but obviously it doesn't matter what state you're in. You need to be aware of it, what it is, how it works. Uh, just, you know, either A, to, to you know use it if you are in one of the states that you could use it, or B, um, to make sure that you're not doing it or doing anything like that for the states that it's illegal in. All right, next one is a legal way to dissolve the relationship when parties don't voluntarily agree to its termination. All right, here is your scramble. And here's your answer. Partition. Partition is a legal way to dissolve a relationship when parties don't voluntarily agree to its termination. So yeah, one of those basic real estate law related uh, terms that you need to be aware of. All right, next one. A method of urban planning in which a municipality or other tier of government divides land into areas, each of which has a set of regulations for new development that differs from other areas. I think that went over. And here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Zoning. Zoning is a method of urban planning in which, you know, any government essentially divides land into areas called zones, each of which have a set of regulations for new development that differs from other zones. Now, it's worth noting there are no federal zoning laws. Uh, governments tend to partition districts and neighborhoods according to a master plan, which we talked about earlier. Zoning usually increases the marketability of a property. The idea is that when a community is organized, it is more attractive, safer, and has fewer conflicts among people. Ironically, however, zoning ordinances often change due to conflicts between citizens and the government and how they should be able to use their property and whatnot. All right, next one. A law that prohibits discrimination in the buying, selling, renting, or financing of housing. These laws prohibit discrimination based on race, religion, color, sex, disability, children, nationality, and more. Here is your scramble. Alrighty, and our answer is... The Fair Housing Act. The Fair Housing Act is a law that prohibits discrimination in the buying, selling, renting, or financing of housing. These laws prohibit discrimination based on race, religion, color, sex, disability, children, nationality, and more. The Fair Housing Act has been amended many times to add more clarification on what is prohibited and what is not. 
As a licensed real estate agent, it is important to make sure all clients are treated in the same fair and honest manner. There should be no differences in services provided based on one person to another. So yeah, fair housing is really, 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 really important. All right, next one. Established in 1974, allowed greater control by EPA to control contaminant levels, take legal action against public water authorities for violations. All right, think that one over. Here's your uh, scramble. And here's your answer. It is the Safe Drinking Water Act, or the SDWA. Established in 1974, it allowed greater control by the EPA to control contaminant levels, take legal action against public water authorities for violations, and require periodic water testing and notification to state authority and homeowners if contaminated. All right, next one. A collection of federal and state government laws that regulate the conduct and organization of business corporations, normally to promote fair competition for the benefit of consumers. So think that one over. Here's your scramble. And our answer, antitrust laws. Antitrust laws are a collection of federal and state government laws that regulate the conduct and organization of business corporations normally to promote fair competition for the benefit of consumers. In retrospect, antitrust laws protect the consumer and are a healthy uh, way to essentially protect the economy. It's important to know and understand the ones that deal with real estate as they directly real, uh, will relate to how you function as an agent. All right, next one, a one-sided agreement. Only one party makes a promise to perform, one party pays the other party to perform a certain duty. Think about that one. Oh, here's your scramble. And your answer for this one is a unilateral contract. Unilateral contract is a one-sided agreement. Only one party makes a promise to perform. One party pays the other party to perform a certain duty. If the first party fulfills the duty, the second party is obligated to transfer the specified funds. An example would be, I pay you $1,000 to bring my car from West Virginia to Colorado. That would be a unilateral contract. All right, next one, all things removable, like clothes, lawnmowers, couches, TVs, and furniture. Here's your scramble. And your answer? is personal property. Personal property is all things removable, like clothes, lawnmowers, couches, TVs, furniture. On the exam, sometimes they refer to the personal uh, property as chattels or chattels. I always butcher this word and I apologize. Um, but when you see it, you see it. It's important to note, you know what? I forgot, I got one of these pens. I'll write it out for you that way. When people say they didn't understand what I was talking about, I can explain this because I've gotten comments like that before. So, um, but this is essentially also personal property. Sometimes they put that on the exam just as a little, you know, way to trick you and confuse you a little bit more. But seriously, it's it's the same same concept, same thing. But yeah, anyways, personal property for uh, you know it includes tangible and intangible items. So like. For a business, tangible personal property would include things like, you know, business equipment or business vehicles and office supplies. An intangible item is merely an item that can't be felt or touched. 
such as bonds, stocks, or you know, intellectual property. Yeah, so that's going to be it for that one. Let's see, next one. Are the rights to the natural resources lying below the Earth's surface? So think that one over. Here is your scramble. And your answer is that subsurface rights. So subsurface rights, or I guess we should start with surface rights. Surface rights are the rights to use the surface of the earth. Subsurface rights are the rights to the natural resources lying below the earth's surface. Interestingly, an owner may transfer rights without transferring the subsurface rights. For example, a landowner can sell his rights to an oil and gas company on his land, but he can still own the land himself. All right, 68. The process of merging together uh, of two or more parcels under one deed to make the single parcel more valuable is known as. And here's your scramble. And here's your answer. Assemblage. The combination or the combining of two or more adjoining uh, lots into one tract, this is usually done to increase value of individual lots because a larger building capable of producing a larger net return uh, means, you know, it's going to be a larger parcel. Or parcel. Uh, the resulting added value is called plottage value. The developer often makes use of option contracts to tie up the right to purchase the desired adjacent parcels. Um, and all that good stuff. But yeah, essentially what you need to know is the process itself of merging these uh, uh, parcels together is assemblage. Pretty straightforward, right? Right. Woo! Wow, if you made it all the way through, first of all, you're amazing. Uh, second of all, I really appreciate the time that you spent with me today. I know this can be intense and a lot for a lot of people, and hopefully you guys learned something, and hopefully I made it a little bit more fun. Obviously, I'm trying to shake things up a little bit and make it more of a enjoyable experience for you guys at home. So yeah, please let me know any comments, questions, any feedback you had on this. Uh, like I said, I'm going to try these new things, because what the heck? We only live once. Let's try and have fun together and learn, of course. So yeah, that's going to be it for me today. Thank you guys so much for watching. As always, this is Zach from RealEstateLicenseWizard.com. Bye-bye.